<laughs> Good morning, everybody. As always, Zoom will take a few minutes to uh, let people in, and then it'll take a couple seconds for everyone to connect to audio. And we'll probably have some more folks uh, straggling over the next couple minutes. But I did want to say welcome to everybody. Uh, this is a little webinar series we're putting on with our uh, friends and partners at uh, BLG. And today we're going to be talking about leveraging IP as an asset, right? We don't want to do things without a reason. We want them to build business value. And so really looking at IP not as an end in itself, but as a tool to build that business value as another asset on that uh, balance sheet that we're building. So one thing to start with, uh, first off, any questions you have throughout the, the conversation, please do unmute yourself. Uh, you can jump in and ask them yourself and or put them in that little chat box. So hopefully we'll have a nice participatory thing. Our friends at BLG came here today, not to answer my questions, not to sort of, uh, you know, talk amongst themselves, but really to answer your questions and make this as meaningful to you as possible. Next slide, please. It would be remiss of me to avoid our uh, uh, land acknowledgement. So it's with gratitude and respect. We acknowledge that the lands on which Foresight operates are the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Myself, I'm talking today from the lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. And I hope you all take a second to recognize the uh, various treaty and non-treaty lands on which you're sitting. Next slide. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to suck up five minutes of your life. I apologize for that. Uh, I will try to make it as painless as possible. We'll then introduce our speakers today. We've got three wonderful people from uh, BLG, Jason Hogg, Mark Vickers, and uh, Vanessa Little. Hear a little bit more about their background and why they're experts in the space. And then we'll get into a little roundtable discussion on intellectual property as an asset. Then we'll move into a little moderated Q&A session. So that'll be really a good chance for you to introduce yourself and also dig deeper into any of the questions. Of course, during that roundtable discussion, if you have any questions that are topical, do feel free to jump in. And then we'll end on uh, with some breakout rooms and I will be back uh, to wrap up and talk about our third installment of this webinar series that's coming up in a couple of weeks and we don't want you to miss that. Without any further ado, let's move into the uh, speaker introductions. Next slide, please. I guess I'll talk about Foresight. I think you all know that uh, a little bit about us because that's why you're here, but we are Canada's largest clean tech accelerator. And uh, you know, as we work with innovative clean technology companies, intellectual property is such a huge value uh, that they generate. Uh, you know, it is so important to understand how you can protect this asset that you're building and what you're doing. So we're really happy to be talking about that today. If you do have any other questions about how we can support you in other areas of activity, please do let us know. Next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Jason to talk a little about BLG. Thanks, Stephen, really appreciate it. And uh, super grateful everybody's uh, made time to join us today. Hopefully we'll deliver uh, some great value and some tidbits that you can take away and, and act on right away. Uh, by way of background, BLG is Canada's largest law firm. Uh, we have five offices across the country, so Toronto, Ottawa, uh, Calgary, Montreal, Vancouver. Uh, we have over 800 lawyers, patent agents, trademark agents, and other professionals, and we cover virtually every area of business law, dispute resolution, and intellectual property services. Um, our expertise spans basically the whole, <laughs> the whole spectrum, financing, mergers, acquisitions, uh, intellectual property, litigation, commercial arbitration, and virtually everything in between, uh, including technology law. Uh, my name is Jason Haug. I'm a patent agent, <laughs> trademark agent, uh, lawyer, and certified licensing professional. Uh, my focus is on the deliberate development of intellectual property strategies. So if you see me smiling all day, uh, it's because this is one of my favorite topics and I think uh, critical to the Canadian uh, innovation landscape. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by, uh, Stephen mentioned, uh, uh, Vanessa Little and Mark Vickers. So, Vanessa. Hi, everyone. I'm Vanessa Little. I'm an associate and patent agent at BLG in Ottawa. I like to describe myself as a PhD chemist who jumped ship to IP. Uh, and I'm specifically a green chemist. So that was what my PhD was in, green chemistry. And uh, my genesis into IP began as an in-house patent specialist working uh, at a not-for-profit whose main goal was to 
develop, de-risk, and scale up green chemical technologies. And so I have the better part of 10 years experience working with uh, academics, SMEs, larger uh, companies, all in the green chemistry and green tech space. And I am very pleased to be here today. Mark? Good morning, all. Thanks very much for this opportunity. It's uh, great to be able to have this conversation with you. My name is Mark Vickers. I'm a partner in patent agent in the Ottawa office of the LG. I am the uh, small L leader of our life sciences group. And really what that means is I get to work with all the great colleagues and talented folks within BLG and the practice groups that Jason was mentioning. So whenever we have questions and that, that need to be addressed, we can bring to bear the full, uh, the full strength that BLG has to offer across all of our practice groups. I started off life as a biochemist, and that has brought me into the life sciences and related clean tech space. And it's, again, my just great pleasure to be with you here today. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I think there's the, the pictures we've got uh, going on of these folks, though we have them live and in person here on our screen. Uh, I think let's, uh, let's dive into a little roundtable discussion on, uh, on intellectual property. And I guess my question is, is, how do you sort of see intellectual property as, as an asset that companies build? Jason, you want to start off talking a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn over to Vanessa uh, to chat about that, and we'll uh, I, I think sort of go through the panel. Stephen, I just want to echo for the audience something that you'd said. Uh, definitely want questions along the way. Uh, amazingly, we have no PowerPoint slides, so uh, you know that's a once in a lifetime kind of event. So I want everybody to take advantage <laughs> of it. Just interrupt us and say I got a question about this or that. Uh, or if you're more comfortable, put it in the chat. We've also got some dedicated Q&A time um, and we'll have time in the breakout session to, to go through questions as well. So definitely finding opportunities to invite this. Um, but Vanessa, do you wanna tackle? Yeah, so it's a fine point that a lot of people do tend to miss that intellectual property is property. And if that property is properly managed and protected, it can be leveraged as an asset. So for example, if your intellectual property takes the form of trademarks, takes the form of patents, takes the form of trade secrets or copyright, those are all things that can be bought, they can be sold, they can be licensed. And as a result, these are things that can bring revenue into your company. In the same token, if they're properly protected and properly managed, your intellectual property can act as a defense to keep your competitors out of your space. So your trademarks can be used to keep your competitors from copying your branding. Your patents can be used to keep your competitors from making, using, and selling your inventions. Your trade secrets can be used to keep your competitors from replicating your recipes. And so as a result of that, you can keep your competitors out of your space. So if your intellectual property is properly managed and properly protected, then it can become an asset that not only brings revenue into your organization and your company, but it can also be used to keep your competitors out of your space. And so that is how intellectual property as property can be leveraged as an asset, albeit an intangible asset, but still an asset. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that, that sums it up beautifully. It's, it's this concept that in our business, in a business, we have a product or service that we're um, commercializing and, and it's a little bit easier to see the tangible effects, uh, the tangible nature of that, of that asset. Your intellectual property assets are really no different. They are still driving value to the company. And that's for, for all the reasons that uh, Vanessa just outlined. I think I would add that, um, and this is sort of a pitfall because it's intellectual form of property and it's intangible, it's harder to see and feel. Um, I think people are less, a little bit unsettled, a little bit less comfortable with it. And the propensity is to wanna to know everything about it before and you kind of lose sight of the fact that it's an asset. So, um, you know, we, we, you go to a car dealership and you buy a car and you sort of kick the tires and you look inside and you might look under the hood, 
but you're not asking the dealership to explain to you how the combustion engine works and the viscosity of the oil and uh, you know trying to understand the springs like it's nobody has time for that and so the the shortcut for us is it's an asset and and it needs to be treated accordingly and then I think um, companies can leverage that more quickly rather than what we see a lot of is you know let's spend hours and hours talking about what a patent is and how to file it and how it works in, in an intricate way and and all the timelines and and I just I, I'm not sure that's valuable so that's why we really want to ground everybody on this is an asset just like you'd buy a car just like you'd you'd have a lease just like you'd uh, have products um, and if you kind of think think about it in that kind of compartment then I think it's easier to to work with. Um, Stephen, I think we're going to move on to the, yeah. the next question. Um, yeah, for sure. And and, um, and, and happy to sort of uh, in that view of it as an asset. Um, I, I was just I was just sort of sort of thinking, it, you might not have this, but but somebody else I was talking to who who managed kind of a a fund and, and bought a bunch of companies said that there's a lot of IP out there and there's a lot of patents filed and a lot of them aren't high quality. And it's not that the claims don't apply and it didn't get past the kind of examination, but they didn't actually add business value, right? They, a lot of times when th that uh, group acquired companies that sort of look and say, yeah, you've got 20 patents, but only two or three of them actually cover something the business does. Like the rest are just sort of theoretical money was spent on them and it looks good on a report of your patenting stuff, but it's not actually driving business value that kind of is an asset that you could sell to someone or license to someone. Um, so I, I wonder, I wonder if those assets, you know, how else are they used as part of a strategy uh, to to defend the company or make it seem like you're bigger than you are? Is it, can people use them like a porcupine and and you know one quill on a porcupine doesn't make a lot of difference, but hundreds do. Well, you know. I think we can, uh, it's a great place to jump in. Yeah. And, and for us, there's, you know, reality. Yeah. Um, and then there's myths. And at the very top of the call, you had, you had said something that I thought was um, kind of at the heart of what we're trying to get at, which is, uh, you know, we're not interested in IP for IP's sake or intellectual property or patents for patent's sake. Should be tied to some kind of value, some kind of business driver, some kind of commercial aim. Um, and if it's not, then, you know, the consequences, exactly as you described, Stephen, you find the patent register littered with a bunch of patents that'll have zero value because, you know, why did we file that? Well, we came up with a good idea. Um, something I try to explain to people is there's a psychological connection. Um, if you invent something, boy, you're tied to it. If you come up with a, a name for your company, boy, you're tied to it, right? You've got a... a um, Kind of a psychological marriage with it so of course you want to file a patent but that's only for ip sake that's not necessarily married to a business driver so right. if, you know let's <clears throat> I, th I think it makes sense at this point you know why don't we jump into um sort of leveraging uh patents in particular I, I we're sort of focused on patents today because we think for yeah. the clean tech audience that's kind of uh, a little bit more relevant than some of the other ip um, but Mark, what, you know, why don't you share a couple and then Vanessa can share a couple and I'll share a couple of reality ways of, of, uh, using, uh, patents. Perfect, Jason. That, that sounds great. Thanks very much. And these ultimately fall under the, the, the umbrella of, of what Jason and Stephen were just talking about. You're ultimately aligning your business imperative with your IP strategy and it's, these are some of the considerations that, that that can be thought of when we're leveraging our IP assets. So our patents, what, what are they doing? It, it's, it's creating a barrier to entry. So the R&D activities that have been undertaken in the company, we now have a patent. It is excluding folks, others, from working within a certain area that's defined by the claims of the patent. And so this is, this is, your, this is your turf. You've put, a, you've put a ring around in the sand and you've defined your area of commercialization. This will discourage your competitors from trying to work within your same space. It'll, it could serve as a barrier to new entrants and really block others, other competitors from working in your space 
that would otherwise be a disadvantage to your to your business efforts. So that's I'd, I'd say one way we can leverage it. The other is um, we've spoken about IP and patents as being an asset, and these assets then are considered as part of an important part of the company's overall strategic position and its value. And that is key when investors are looking at the company to invest, partner with, acquire. Those folks will take a very hard look at the company's underlying intellectual property assets. This is important not only for the largest of companies, but it's especially important for the early stage companies, the startups, because this is a calling card to investors that the company is on a sound, has a sound strategy and is going in the right direction. It can also, as a, as a bit of an aside to that, it can also help with government funding when there's lots of opportunity for companies to obtain funding for R&D activities or IP related to our, our, their R&D activities. They will take a look at what IP the company will already have to look for that track, track record of success. So that, that can help a great deal as well. And I think the other way to leverage it, IP, and this is often overlooked. It's, 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 not, it, it's not considered, it's not top of mind. And that's a defensive publication of patent, your patent applications. And this is to ensure, so we, we define the area that we're commercially gonna work within with our patents. Our patent applications are published. And that will ensure that the competitors cannot file patent applications to the same technology. So it's important to create this public record. And, and for a variety of reasons, the patent applications that are published, it's a very effective way to have a defensive publication. And this, again, ensures that others aren't fast following and getting patents to your technology. And so then further defining your safe space. And so it's, it's really, I, I, I think my top three are leveraging the IP assets. It's creating a barrier to entry. It's being a calling card to investors and it's this defensive nature of patent applications. Great. And so um, to add to that, I have a few more ways that we can also add or leverage value out of our patents uh, and our intellectual property as an asset. So one of the ways is through what we call defensive patenting. And there's a number of things that can fall under the umbrella of defensive patenting. I, you know, Mark touched on one of them, which is creating that barrier to entry. You're putting you know, fences around your, your technologies, your inventive concepts through your patent applications. But another way that we can, you know, leverage our patent applications and our patents through defensive patenting is by actually building sort of a defensive network of patent applications and patents around a core technological pillar, if you will. And I'll give a, a highly simplified, uh, idealized example of this that is devoid of all the nuance and it depends exceptions that come with the legal profession, all right? So this is for demonstrative purposes only, but imagine you have created a drug. Uh, it's a new drug and it's you patent that drug. And you found that there are a number of ways that you can manufacture this drug, but to, in order to do it economically on mass, you actually needed to create a new piece of equipment because otherwise it wasn't economical. And so you also patent the equipment, the new equipment around manufacturing the drug. It can be used for other things as well. So now you've got two patents, one for your drug and one for the equipment that makes manufacturing the drug economical. And of course, in Canada, if you're in the drug space, someone's gonna take a run at your drug patent. So imagine somebody does, and we don't agree with the ruling, but the judge finds that your drug patent isn't valid, but it holds your equipment patent to be valid. So now, yes, anyone can make, use, or sell your drug, but they can't make it economically without access to your equipment patent. And so now your layered defense around this making, using, and selling the drug 
even though your patent for the drug has been lost, your patent to the equipment that makes the drug economically will act as a barrier to your competitors trying to get into the space because they'll either have to come to you for licensing in order to be able to use it uh, freely with your permission or they're going to have to come up with it on their own, their own workaround to make this drug in an economical way. And so because you've built this defensive network of patent applications around your, your key technology pillar, this drug, even though you've lost one line of defense, you can rely on this other line of defense to sort of control access to the market because now they still need you in order to be able to do it effectively and economically. So that's an example and an idealized demonstrative only example of how building a defensive network around your, your core pillars can really help you in terms of protecting your concepts in case one patent goes down or a competitor finds a workaround you still have other aspects of that technology that's protected that you can enforce to manage your space in the market. The other is collaboration. Collaborations can be great. Uh, they can really help build network and community amongst SMEs and startups, but there can be a lot of anxiety around coming to the table over these collaborations because how do you keep your IP separate? How do you protect the IP you're coming to the table with? And how do you distinguish that from any of the IP that's created coming out of the project? Patents can actually be a really great use um, of delineating background IP from project IP. Because if you've taken your intellectual property, you've documented it, you've written it down, you've filed it with a patent office, and it has a formal date. And that date is clearly a, you know, prior to the beginning of your collaboration then it's very clear, it's very easy to distinguish, this is my IP that I'm coming to the table with. This predates our collaborative process and our collaborative project. And your collaborators can do the same thing. So you can both come to the table with some measure of, of security that your background IPs are distinct and distinguished and that anything that comes of your collaboration moving forward could fall under the project IP. And then you, know, you can have your agreements and your understandings and your processes around how that project IP will be managed and protected. And then the final, that sort of is a, a, a tag on to collaboration is um, things like material transfer agreements. So if you're built, you know, if you're creating uh, new compositions of matter, for instance, and you're sending them to investors for their own independent testing, third-party testers for characterization, you know, collaborators so that they can do their part of a, of a project. Um, and you, know, you will likely want to protect the dissemination of that, those samples through a mass transfer agreement. But a mass transfer agreement, like all other uh, confidentiality agreements, are only as good as the folks who sign them. And if it happens that there's an inadvertent disclosure along the way, we can't unring that bell. Um, whereas if anything that you're about to send off in a sample for testing, for characterization, for evaluation, already forms, is already protected in the form of a patent application, then you have uh, additional sense of security that should that bell be rung inadvertently throughout the testing, uh, you still have your intellectual property protected um, in your patent applications that have been written down, documented, and filed with the patent office. So those are three ways, defensive patenting, uh, supporting collaborations, and also supporting the, the external testing of your materials. The patents can be leveraged to help further uh, your business and commercial objectives. Thanks, Vanessa. I, I, I'd add a couple more. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's probably some audience fatigue on this, but we're really just trying to demonstrate uh, what the value can be. It doesn't mean that it's going to be valuable in all these areas for everybody, but the trick is developing a, a strategy around it. You would say, well, which of these resonate with us, given our competitive landscape, given our budget, uh, given the inputs we have, given people that we might want to collaborate with, given our technology. Um, but I think it's remiss to not look at these and say, why are we filing this patent? Which of these criteria sort of fits? 
and and sort of create a mini business case, frankly, for filing a patent and say, well, our hope, and this is what we want to get out of it, is we think this is going to drive people to want to collaborate with us because otherwise they're going to be left out in the cold. Um, and so, you know, we want a certain quality of patent. We want to tell the story a certain way to draw people in. And then that's very valuable information to share with a, with a patent agent. Um, so two other values that, um, and these are the simplest ones um, and the most obvious, but for the, uh, I think for most people in this audience, they're also the, the more medium and long term uh, range uh, ones. And, <clears throat> and it's a Canadian audience. So I, I <clears throat> at the risk of being impolite, um, patents can be an offensive tool. So Vanessa talked about it being defensive um, and Mark talked about barriers to entry. So, uh, you know, I remember doing a, a seminar in um, Halifax, an IP, uh, uh, an IP workshop. And there was a mass, somebody from a massive life sciences company and they affirmed that they actually do look at other people's patents. And if they see something that they think is too close, they will design around that, they will avoid the patent, they're not going to consciously infringe something. So these can be effective barriers to entry uh, for large and small companies and competitors. Um, and then Vanessa talked about the value of drawing in collaborators because they're interested in your technology, they see value in your company, and then as a point of delineation. Um, but ultimately, patents can also be a, used in an offensive manner, which is to shut companies down uh, from using your technology. And it's, you know, Canadian companies are often very polite, don't want to talk about suing competitors. Um, so the long range kind of planning on it is, you know, at some point you'll have an exit strategy, presumably a larger company. They may not be thrilled with competitors stepping into your technology area and actually may want to enforce patents. So I think you have to keep it at the back of your mind. Um, I've had lots of companies say, well, you know what, Jason, I can't drum up the millions of dollars to start a lawsuit. That's okay. Don't, don't expect that. Um, but in terms of long range planning, you, it may very well be that you're acquired by a company or you have investors who want to have competitors shut down and, and there will be money available then want to make sure the patent's suitable for that purpose. Um, and then we've been talking all along about patents as an asset. So of course they can be sold, they can be licensed. That's not usually something that's happening early in the company stage because it takes a while to get patents, a number of years. Um, and you aren't necessarily selling off your core technology, but as part of a bigger M&A, for example, or as part, part of selling a patent portfolio, uh, these assets can be extremely valuable. So that's sort of super obvious, but maybe not as uh, relevant immediately for, for uh, SMEs. So Stephen, I th think we kind of <laughs> really, really wanted to answer that question for you. Um, no, and and I, I, it actually, it, it, for me, it's raised a bunch of questions. I think it might be interesting to stop and ask the audience if, if they've kind of got, got any questions that, you know, how to, uh, around some of those uses that you've described. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to kind of, go first i think you bring up you brought up value somewhere in there. and we kind of started on that topic there's lots of patents and some of them have a lot of value and some of them don't and i, I love vanessa's example of like you know maybe you patent something and then later on you find out it's not actually uh valid some you know somebody rules that's too close to something already existing or it's not you know um, not sufficiently non-obvious or whatever the kind of criteria that they like to to invalidate those things after the fact. But we mentioned that it could be used in in, in you know in value in being valued by investors. Uh, and so how how do those investors value a patent? And I mean, you sort of mentioned like, you know, do a business case and we're hoping to, that this will cause people to collaborate with us. We'll get a business deal out of it. I mean, do people in, is the best practice to actually sit down and say like, I think if we patent this thing, I mean, if it's the kind of machine that makes the drug, we think we can make, you know, a billion units of these pills at 10 cents each. So it's worth, you know, a hundred million bucks a year. That, that's what this patent is worth on this machine. Like how do folks value patents? So there's a, a number of different methodologies, but I, I, I'm going to move away from kind of the technical answer. Okay. And, and I'll give you a, a real world example. 
Okay. Um, and then we can kind of build from there because, you know, mileage is going to vary depending on, on the investor and the company. Um, but, but let me start with a really simple example. Um, so we're acting for a company and they got an expression of interest from a, a one of today's technology giants. So I, I won't name the company, but everybody on the call would recognize and everybody's using their software probably right now. Um, it's not Zoom, but maybe some <laughs> different software. Um, anyway, technology giant and, and they call us and they say, hey, this technology client's actually interested in us. Um, we haven't got to in, into any due diligence with them yet, uh, but we expect that to be proximate. We're gonna sign a term sheet with them. And we're just wondering from an IP perspective, like they're a technology company, they're clearly interested in IP, you know, what might they be looking at um, in our company uh, where they might drive the value down and say, you know what, you haven't kind of taken the steps, you guys aren't kind of really playing ball, you don't really understand IP. And conversely, what can we do to drive up the value? So we took a look. I don't remember everything we did, but um, one thing, <laughs> that we paid close attention to was making sure they own the IP that they said they owned. That's very important. And, and I think we can get into a little bit more discussion uh, on this call about that, because that, to me, that's kind of a really something you can really control easily and take care of. You just have to take the step. So we help them uh, cinch up uh, employment agreements. Uh, we help them with some of their contractor agreements. And then they said, we asked them, we said, well, do you guys have any, like, you must have some technology and there's probably something patentable. And they said, well, we're not sure, but we've got a couple of things kicking around. We filed provisional patents for it. Um, fast forward at the end of the deal and we filed just two pretty skinny provisionals pretty quickly, clearly from a due diligence team, they were just filed. So they weren't granted patents. And the value that we generated through our actions was about $100,000. So it was, I don't know what it was, ten, fifteen thousand dollars of fees, and we got a ten-time multiplier on it. Um, and it's because a technology giant is going to hire a sophisticated counsel. They're going to look for, you know, a huge checklist. We beat them to the punch. So when they look at the company, they go, "Wow, these guys are really lined up. They've got great employment agreements. They clearly own their IP. The chain of title isn't an issue. They uh, have thought about and have filed some patents strategically that make sense." They've got their trademarks under control. And, you, and, and it's just, you know, then human nature kicks in. So if you think about the flip, if I'm doing due diligence on a company, I start looking, I start doing digging on IP and I start to find, oh, you know what, this is sloppy. Oh, this isn't very high quality. This isn't, you know, they didn't do their employment agreements correctly. Uh, the chain of title is off. They don't really even seem to own this patent. You start to get nervous and then you dig deeper. And guess what? Eventually it'll drive the value down because you're like, you know what, this company, like you're gonna spend a lot of money to kind of fix things up. So if you can do that proactively, you know, there's a dollar value right there on, on sort of two, um, two patent filings and, you know, some uh, contract cleanup, very quickly generated value. Um, the, the next sort of level of investor is, you know, maybe not terribly sophisticated so forget about technology giant, you know, just kind of average investor. They don't understand patents. They don't understand trademarks. They don't really know what it means. But again, they're looking for a level of sophistication in the company. And they're going to peg value to that. And they're going to say, you know what, this company has no patents. Maybe the investor doesn't understand trade secrets. They haven't protected their trademarks. So, uh, you know, I don't really think they, they kind of, they're in, they don't seem to be in the game. Um, right. and, and investors can, you know, kind of not necessarily walk away, but they'll want to drive the value down. So that's kind of the non-technical way of, of doing it. Um, there can be very sophisticated valuations on IP as well, where they actually look at the claims. They, you know, may run searches to see what else is out there. Um, and, you know, the old fashioned way was all the value of a company, anything that's left is then intangible. Uh, there's more sophisticated ways of doing it today. Um, but companies are looking at it and they are considering yeah. it. We can't really, really kind of kid, kid ourselves, ourselves that investors and companies that are going to buy you are, are not paying attention to this stuff because they are. I think we've got some questions. Okay. Up. Fair enough. Uh, uh, that answer. Uh, there's a question from Matthew. When's the right stage in consumer to a property? So I, I think there's like an on sale date. So you have one year, I think in the US after you actually uh, market something that you can still patent it is my rough understanding of that. Uh, and then, so does it make sense 
to find the product market fit first? Or does it make sense to kind of protect it first, right? Because there's no point, again, and, I'm, and this kind of harks back to my, my favorite topic, value. You know, you don't want to patent something if nobody wants to buy it. So, I mean, what would you kind of counsel in that case? Uh, and But there are other jurisdictions where I think as soon as it's public knowledge, you've lost the ability to patent it is is right. So yep. how does that, how do those things kind of play into the advice you might give someone? So first of all, it's a terrific question. Uh, really important to understand this one. And Mark, you want to talk about sort of the Goldilocks moment? Yeah, happy to, Jason. Thank, thank you. That And it's a fantastic question. There is a really, there truly is a Goldilocks moment when it's not too early and not too late to prepare and file your patent application. So we've been speaking about the alignment of your IP strategy with your corporate imperative. So IP is following the corporate lead. At the same time, concurrently, there are R&D efforts going on at the company. And over the course of those R&D activities, the company will get to a point where they're really excited about the results. There is a eureka. That eureka is there because they've discovered something new that will allow them to generate income through their products, through their services, or they believe will be able to, to, to protect their products and services. Because it, it, so now there's this alignment of corporate imperative and your, and your IP. And you get to that moment, you have your eureka, but of course, the R&D efforts are still ongoing. Those are tend to always proceed. So now to your question, when do we file our patent application? There's a tension between, it's a balance between filing too early and too late. If you file too early after that, right after that initial Eureka, you may capture the Eureka, but the subsequent R&D efforts may reveal there's better Eurekas. There's more fully developed Eurekas that protect your product in a way that you hadn't anticipated, or rather your, your, what will ultimately your pro be your product evolves in a way that you hadn't necessarily anticipated because research is not always predictable. So it can then therefore be a benefit to wait a little while after that initial Eureka. So where's the tension? The tension is that you have competitors. You have competitors that are following on your heels and are working in your space. And it's ultimately a, um, a race to the patent office who gets to the patent office first wins. It, ideally it's you, you wanna keep your pat your competitors at bay. So there's the tension. We wanna fully develop our invention in our Eureka versus the, this competition to get to file early, to beat our competitors. That's the risk if we wait too late and it's fully developed, overdeveloped, and we've spent too long and we're now in the patent office, but we're not the first one there. So the question's ideal. There's a sweet spot between too early and too late. Identifying that is, is, the, is the, keeping that eye on that ball is you have to make sure that your IP strategy is aligned with your corporate needs and you have to talk with your IP counsel to give them a sense of where you are, what you're doing, and they'll start asking you, okay, well, what are the subsequent R&D activities will you be doing? How else might this evolve? They will give, be able to provide some input and guidance on, will we get the type of protection that we're interested in now, or are we better off waiting a little while longer? So there is a Goldilocks moment. It's, it's not good to file too early. It's not good to file too late. And you have, it's a real conversation between the company, your IP counsel as to thinking about that. Because if you do do it too early, then you know you might not get the meaningful protection that you'd like. Mark, I think something you shared that is really powerful is um, sort of the conversation. So, you know, real world example, uh, have uh, clients present in our office. Can you file this patent application for us? That's what we do. So happy to jump in, we file it. Um, and then subsequently it's revealed that they're doing, that the company is doing more R and D. And in fact, they've come up with the next thing. And then they're sort of, well, can we amend what we filed? And can we, and you know, 
So I think, Mark, you know, you really hit on something about having that conversation about what are your aims and kind of where are you at in the development cycle? Do you have a sense that, you know, that there is a market for it before you get sort of too far along and, and really trying to assess that, that Goldilocks moment? Um, the, the second part, uh, Matthew, to your question was about the one year grace period and public disclosure. And Vanessa, I know that's something that, that you're pretty passionate about helping people understand sort of what that means. I don't know if you want to chat about that for, for a minute. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a tangent. Um, but along those same, uh, along that vein of what constitutes a, a public disclosure. Uh, and you know, I would unfortunately be able to retire if I had a dollar for every time somebody was like, oh, it's not publicly disclosed. I just presented it to my department. Um, oh, it's not publicly disclosed. I went to a conference, but there was only 30 people there during my talk. Um, or no, it's not publicly disclosed, but I've submitted this abstract that describes exactly the, the inventive concept. So in... Um, Public disclosures can be very insidious um, in terms of what will constitute a public disclosure. It all comes down to, unfortunately, these ever-shifting sands of you know, what the courts are deciding, um, depending on the country that you're interested in. But you know, a good practice, internal practice, is to not discuss your inventions outside of your inventive group, whether it's the group of inventors, whether it's the research and development group, even if you're talking to people out within your organization but are who are outside of your particular research group, it's always helpful to ask yourself, you know, is me talking about this protected under confidentiality agreements, employment agreements, understandings of confidentiality, or has it been properly sanitized that whatever I'm saying is, you know, general knowledge? And that's not to say to be paranoid uh, about every step of every way, but just to be aware and to ask yourself the question, because what can constitute a public disclosure will change at the whims of the courts. It will depend on the countries that you're interested in. Some have higher bars where, you know, you can disclose something and they'll give you six to 12 months to follow up with a patent filing. Um, some will say if you've disclosed it at all, we'll give you nothing. Um, some, you know, the caveat, the list of caveats are long before they'll, they'll give you a bit of a grace period on what you've disclosed. And so really at any point, if you're discussing your inventions uh, with family, with friends, um, with third party suppliers, with going to a conference, going to a seminar, going to, you know, some sort of trade show, anything that is outside of your cluster of folks who are developing this technology, ask yourself, is this safe? Because depending on the jurisdiction, that conversation, even if it's just between you and this one person and no one else was in the room, could be considered a public disclosure. A good example of this is in Canada. Um, this was old case law. Uh, somebody engineered a new carburetor, put it in their car, drove it around for over a year. Uh, nobody knew about it, only the inventor. But that car was left unsupervised in public spaces all throughout that year. And at the time, it was found that even though no one looked at the car, no one found the carburetor, the fact that they could have and could have, you know, reverse engineered it um, was considered a, a public disclosure. So that's old case Canadian case law. So that shows you how, how low that bar can be. Um, so my top you know, some of the top myths is what constitutes a public disclosure, that would be it. And the other is um, feeling that you're free to talk about it if there's a patent application that's filed. Oh, we filed something, it's free, I can talk about it. Um, and it's true that you can talk about whatever is within the four walls of that document. But if there are ongoing research and developments that are happening, any new results, any new experimental, Anything that has been done that's not in the body of that application, discussing it could constitute a disclosure of that new material. So just because you have something filed, 
uh, doesn't necessarily grant you a carte blanche to, to talk about it freely either. So it's just good to be aware of this, not to live in fear of it, but to be aware of it and to ask yourself those questions prior to discussing your work. Is it protected? What's protected? What And who am I talking to? And, and Vanessa, I'd like having all that background before talking about the one year grace period, because, you know, once you appreciate that's a little bit tenuous sometimes that there might be public disclosure, then relying on a one year grace period on top of that uh, can be quite a risky strategy. And Vanessa, yeah. you alluded to the fact that there's very few countries uh, yes. of, of importance, like Canada and the US and Australia Canada, and US. Mexico. Um, yeah, you know, South so Korea Europe on is one only. that's, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, Europe is one that has a, um, really offers no substantial grace period. Um, and any, any sort of countries that do offer a grace period outside of Canada and the US, there, are, so there's a high degree of caveats. Sometimes it's only if it's within a certain circuit of conferences, um, you know, sometimes if it's only directly from the inventor, like, in order to assess that, you would need to go to patent agents within each of those countries and get their insight on what constitutes a public disclosure and whether or not those public disclosures would be offered any kind of grace period within their jurisdiction. And so from a budget management standpoint, that can get very expensive having to go to the individual countries of interest and discussing what are the meets and bounds of their grace periods, if there are any. And it's so much easier to cut that off at the pass by not disclosing in the beginning. So I got a, a, a follow-up question for Matthew because uh, my background is I, I did B2B stuff and it's really easy in a B2B world where you're trying to sell you know, high, uh, you know, high, relatively high dollar values to a limited number of folks that you just put them under an NDA and then you can kind of share what you're doing and get sort of some validation going forward. Matthew's talking about a consumer product. Um, are there ways you've seen people get some validation? I mean, you can't kind of stand at your local, I don't know why I'm thinking about pet food here, but your local Bosley's pet food store and have everybody sign an NDA before you show them your better dog food. Um, but are there ways that you could gain some of that market insight and see if people are willing to pay for it without constituting a public disclosure? The way yeah, that you can like would be to be, I don't know. Yeah, there, there is. And, and it's the, the public disclosure. And I think Vanessa, you mentioned it, it needs to be enabling. So it actually has to talk about sort of the, the secret sauce, the, the recipe. Um, the carburetor example is a scary one because it's sort of displayed and it's out there and, and somebody could reverse engineer it as sort of the argument. Um, so you can't kind of go that far, but you could talk about, hey, we have a software product and this is what it is accomplishing is quite different than saying, hey, we have a software product. This is what it's accomplishing. And, you know, these are the modules involved and in how they interact. Um, this is a consumer product. Um, you know, here's the display of it. Here's how it works. Here's all the pieces. Here's a diagram uh, uh, of the, uh, an exploded diagram of all the parts. That's probably enabling public disclosure, but saying, hey, we've developed the product and here's sort of a picture of a prototype that actually doesn't kind of give away the inner workings, uh, assuming that the patent is directed to some of the inner workings, uh, that can be a way to do some market testing without uh, the fear of public disclosure. Right. But it's always best to check with somebody because it's a challenge, frankly. Right. But as soon as you sell the item, that's public. Like as soon as it enters the hand of somebody else, you actually give a unit. That's definitely the, the horses out of the barn at that point. Yeah. And in um, the US, the offer to sell it is, is uh, horses out of the barn as well. So that's even more challenging. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Scott uh, has kind of a longer question. It seems a little bit, uh, there's some nuances. Scott, would you care to unmute yourself and you can sort of ask your question yourself or do you trust me to interpret it appropriately? Uh, no, thanks. I can do that. Um, yes, like I said, uh, we're recently in a meeting with a technology uh, supplier. Uh, this would be a company that has dozens of patents and you know, 200 scientific papers on, on their uh, technology. They said to me, and I found it, I found it hard to believe that they don't pursue patents anymore. They do public disclosure and keep their inner workings as a trade secret. Um, do you have any thoughts about this? Or 
why they would do that because it seems to run counter to everything that's been discussed here today. So, um, so I'm happy to talk and great question, Scott, and thanks for asking. Um, and, and Mark touched a bit on this, so I'll, I'll turn over to Mark uh, in a second. But I, as a starting point, you know, a trade secret, I mean, it has to be secret. So you, there's no way they can have a trade secret and be publishing that very thing, that those two just kind of don't go hand in hand. Um, and then from a defensive publication perspective, uh, some companies, once once it's in an article, once it's in a patent application and it's published, then it's uh, it's out there for everybody to see. So the trick with a patent is you file a patent application, it gets published, everybody can see it. Then of course you wanna work really hard to get a patent because then they can't use it. Uh, the challenge with a, a, a trade um, a technical journal or trade publication is um, it becomes public, but there's no credible threat after the fact. There's no patent that's going to be granted, so there's no way to enforce it. You're really just putting the information out there. And the strategy behind that is you're putting the information out, defensive publication, that means somebody else can't patent it around you. They can't go to the patent office, get a patent for exactly your technology because you've already disclosed it publicly. Yes. The one risk, though, with this is, and Mark, I don't know if you want to chat about it a bit, but um, pat, um, sorry, uh, examiners in the patent office, they have kind of blinders on and they're looking at patent applications typically. That's where they're looking for, you know, has this been done before? Has this already been disclosed? They're not typically looking at uh, uh, technical journals or trade journals. So the risk is you publish it in, you know, uh, Nature Magazine, patent examiner may not look there. They're going to be looking at things that have been filed that are right in front of them. And if they don't find it, they may actually grant a patent. And then you've got this uncomfortable situation of saying, well, this really stinks because we've got this great technology. Somebody else has patented it. And now we have to kind of unwind and figure out how to, how to get out of that s scenario. So uh, I don't, you know, I think it's an inexpensive way of getting information out to the public domain. So it's valuable that way. But from a patent perspective and, and some of the strategy, I think it's a little bit riskier. Mark, did you have any thoughts? I, I except to say I agree with all. It's when, if we're going to use a defensive publication, patent examiners will more readily find a patent application. That is their world. They will search that. The trade journal should, pub, the trade journal publication route, Although the examiner could or should find it, they won't necessarily. That's that's just not the way they they hunt for references. And it's putting in a roadblock during the process in which someone is trying to acquire a patent is much more straightforward than trying to knock out an issued patent. And that Jason, this is exactly what Jason was was suggesting. It, it it's much it's a much bigger deal if you think, well, the examiner should have found this, but they didn't. And now my competitor has a patent that's preventing me from doing my activities. That's a pickle. That's a real pickle. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting how they've kind of changed from going the patent route to this route. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I might have gone a different direction with them. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, not to, I think uh, it seems like they've got lots of value. They've understood the value of patenting. And for me, I always describe it as sort of an iceberg principle. So nobody can afford to patent everything they come up with. It just doesn't happen. Even the, the technology giants can't and won't do it. Um, so what you see above the waterline, the tip of the iceberg is what you might patent. But underneath the water is really what makes the world go, what makes the business world go around, which is a massive amount of trade secrets that gives you competitive advantage. That means that you can do things uh, more efficiently and effectively than your competitors. And you know we protect that stuff. Um, so and there's a balance between defensive publication to make sure you're not blocked by a competitor and keeping things uh, secret. But again, that's kind of a you know there's a nugget of strategy there that you know we're typically discussing with clients to say what's kind of the right balance. Okay, great, but great, great question. Thanks for your comments. Awesome. Uh, yeah, good. Good. Uh... Good little chat there on on that uh, the specifics of of defensive publications. I like that term. Um, 
Stephen, so, I'm just looking at the time. Yeah, so I know. I'm just, I'm just wondering if maybe if uh, Vanessa and Mark are up for it, if we do sort of a lightning round. Yeah. Of, um, because it, it, one thing that I think we want to chat about is just to share with people some of the elements or building blocks of an IP strategy. Because that's kind of the question is, what what should I be looking at? Like, where I'm at today, is there kind of a universal best practice? Um, and, you know, we've got about four minutes, I think, to kind of do it. So I, I wouldn't propose, Vanessa and Mark, that we get into kind of details. But, you know, what, what, what would you say are kind of the top universal things that you're looking at and, and prescribing for people? Vanessa, wanna, you know, what, what are a couple that you might share? Okay, so very quickly, uh, training. So in-house IP training, having your folks with a working understanding or foundational knowledge of what IP is, being able to identify it when it comes up, understanding how to protect it, um, that will help you protect not only your intellectual property in-house, but will also help avoid treading into the space of other people's IP and using that without their permission. And all of the, the, the firestorm that can come from um, you know, inadvertently infringing on somebody else's work uh, and you know, kind of tarnishing what could otherwise be a nice licensing collaborative uh, relationship with IP that you might otherwise um, like to use. And the other is going back to always remembering that your intellectual property is a business asset. It should be used and leveraged to further and to support your business development and your commercial objectives. So making a, you know, having a very, very deliberate tailored strategy to make sure that, you know, if you've got a flagship technology and you want to protect that so you can enforce it against all of your competitors, that you're putting the tens of thousands of dollars and months of time and resources into fortifying that patent application. Versus if you're looking to protect a less than flagship technology for licensing purposes, and maybe you're only putting thousands of dollars and weeks worth of work into that. Versus if you have an inventive aspect, you just want to make sure your competitors can patent, and you put together a defensive publication on the order of hundreds of dollars in a few days, so that everything that you're doing from an IP standpoint is there to further a business objective. Those are some of the universal must-haves in my world. Mark? Mark you got, do you have a couple? I do have a couple, and I'll, I'll do this. Uh, I think I can do this quickly. We've talked about um, patents as, the, as, as assets, which the assets that they are. The other part, the flip side of the coin is um, when we're proceeding with our commercial endeavors, when we're selling our products and services, we also want to make sure that we don't infringe upon someone else's patents. And Vanessa just uh, touched on that. We want to assess freedom to operate. So in as much as our patents are fences around our technologies, we want to make sure our activities don't end up in the fence of someone, else, someone else's patents. Because patents don't give you the ability to the permission to sell your product. They're, they're just, they keep people out. And so if I have um, an improved, we, so we see a lot of technologies in the battery space, great green, green te, uh, clean tech space. So improvements, um, higher capacities, less toxicities in my new, my new technology. That's, that's my invention. Well, it could be that the foundational battery patents are still alive and just by making and selling my improved battery, I still step in the toes of someone else's patent. And so I want to do a freedom to operate analysis. I want to understand the competitor's patent landscape to understand if there's risk in me proceeding and what that risk may or may not be. Um, so I, I think that's my tops. You, the, it's the flip side of, flip side of, of patent acquisition. Um, and I'll uh, patent what is important. Patent what is in core to the business. We can't patent everything. It's unlikely we can patent everything. Patent what is core. Brilliant, Mark. Um, the first one's so tough to get our heads around. Um, and I think people really struggle with it. <clears throat> On my best day, I probably can't explain it very well to people, but I think the way you put it uh, quite succinctly an improvement. So you come up with something that's a little bit better. 
but that doesn't mean you've eradicated all of the, the prior technology that's out there. Cell phones is probably the best example of this because there's constant development. You know, there's a new swiping method or a new way of recognizing your face when, when you're wearing a mask. But that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, all the other patents are somehow, you know, can be ignored. So I think freedom to operate is key. Um, I guess what I would add is I kind of alluded to trade secrets being sort of the iceberg principle. Um, and so, you know, you'll never get a patent if you're stepping into public disclosure the way Vanessa described. Um, so whether it's potentially patentable technology or other forms of trade secrets, I think taking uh, uh, steps to protect it is important. And one real life, real world example uh, that, you know, just really hurts because I, uh, you know, love this client, but they um, panic phone call. Um, one of their ex-employees walked out with a USB stick and uh, it had all of their key technical information on it. And the resulting steps were to get a, a forensic accounting firm involved to find out uh, what the ex-employee had done by way of disclosure. Uh, they uh, happily, the ex-employee made assurances that they didn't mean to kind of disclose it. And I'm not sure why they gathered in the, it in the first place, but happy ending, uh, but about $100,000 in fees for forensics, for the uh, legal fees involved to understand the exposure. Some of their technology, it was uh, about to be patented. So I had to analyze that as well. Uh, in terms of uh, whether it constitute a public disclosure. So massive headache, we'd love to avoid that. So taking steps to protect trade secrets beyond having a non-disclosure agreement, but using you know physical barriers, making sure people can't just uh, walk all over your office, um, making sure that you're disclosing on a need to know basis, sometimes having locked rooms, like there's lots of steps that can be taken. Um, so that's something that I'm always keen to look at. Um, I mentioned employment agreements. Let's get those right. As Canadian companies, let's get those right. Um, it's not a, a difficult thing. You're really just after making sure employees have an obligation to disclose inventions that they create in the scope of employment, making sure those are owned by the employer, making sure there's specific assignment language. And, and then you get a big check mark from Jason uh, when he's doing due diligence on the company that you know you're hopefully selling for, for billions of dollars. So um, you know, some easy steps there. And then, you know, I guess the quality of agreements generally is important because people, when they're do, do, doing due diligence or sometimes investors, when they're looking under the hood, um, you know, something as simple as a supply agreement or a contractor agreement or a joint venture agreement, all have intellectual property implications. Great to uh, know that you own it, or if you have a license to it, that you've got the right scope. So those things I think are important. Anyway, Stephen, want to share those because that's yeah, you know, yeah, everybody yeah, no, kind of wonders a... like what's a starting point, and there's you know I think a few quick hitters for everybody. Yeah, I mean I, I think the uh, the freedom to operate or the FTO is always one that I I ask folks when they when they join up say because you got a great idea, you don't see anybody doing it in the marketplace currently doesn't mean that you're not going to be you know stepping on somebody's toes, right? And it could be um, you know existing patents that that will limit or that you'll have to license technology or will, you know, further curtail your activity. So I think that those are some wonderful kind of starting steps to take. Um, you know, I, I think at the beginning I said, let's do breakout rounds, but it's, breakout rooms, but it's a fairly small group. Why don't we all just stay together? Uh, I'm going to switch gears here. I'm going to ask kind of the people in the audience to take a couple seconds, introduce themselves, why they're here, what their interest is in intellectual property. And maybe if they've got a venture kind of, a quick 20-second uh, summary of what it is they're doing, and then we can kind of jump into some more questions. Uh, Connie, do you want to go first? And uh, I'm skipping Barnaby. I'm going to go alphabetically, but he works for Foresight, so uh, I'm, that's why I'm passing over you. I apologize, Barnaby. Hey, uh, my name is Connie Eckland. I'm the CEO of NanoTerraTech. I'm here with my partner, Scott, and we're very interested in finding out about IP because we're just in the beginnings of our business and know we've got something special. So thank you very much for everything you're showing us today. Appreciate it. Fantastic. And, and we'll kind of come back to you for some other questions that you might have of, of how to kind of get started and some of the, some maybe deep, dive deeper into that. Uh, Madi, uh, Madi Marathi, do you want to unmute yourself? Maybe you turn your camera on and, and say a quick hello. Uh, hello, this is Madi Marathi. I'm from Internet. Actually, the question, uh, thank you for your very thoughtful uh, uh, seminar. 
uh, actually the question actually that I have, uh, our company uh, is developing a biopolymer, um, an organic biopolymer that when mixed with the wide range of the plastics, polymer and textile, it creates antimicrobial efficacy on those products. And there are currently over 40,000 different uh, consumer products that are neutrally, uh, are not antimicrobial. But uh, this is a platform technology. The, my question actually is that, uh, what's the best way, because we cannot patent uh, all those consumer products as antimicrobial products. Uh, what is the best way to uh, somehow protect that uh, IP against a variety of the uh, consumer product that we are doing, for instance, PPEs, for instance, textile, garment, and even uh, the uh, uh, tablet cases, whatever that you see is, as a plastic or polymer or textile, and we can make it antimicrobial. What's the best way to protect that uh, IP? Mark, Thank you. Vanessa, do you guys have thoughts? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, ha happy to Jason or, or, or Vanessa as well. It's and yeah, thank you. That's um, that sounds like an exciting uh, product you have in the works. So very glad to hear of your your success. The um, biopolymer. So you have a new the R Eureka is the biopolymer with antimicrobial properties, and that is what it sounds like is the invention. That's the Eureka. Not so much what the specific um, items that it can be applied to. It's, it's not necessarily the surfaces that are applied to, although the surfaces may have properties that make it more conducive to, to binding. Um, so your patent claims would likely look something along the lines of getting protection for the biopolymer, independent of what it's applied to. So therefore, any it, it, and it depends on the how your, your patent is drafted and the claims and how it ultimately issues with all those caveats. But your biopolymer, ideally you will get protection to a biopolymer applied to anything. Biopolymer with antimicrobial properties applied to anything. And that would be the um, competitive advantage, I think. Is that, is that getting to your question Vanessa yeah Jason, would but you, the would you issue is that, that uh, this biopolymer uh, is in different form and shape for instance if it's emulsified in the liquid it can be uh, disinfectant if added to the um, hand sanitizer it's in gel form it can create uh, hand sanitizer and if added to the regular plastics dried and added as a master batch to the plastics. It can create, let's say, a textile, antimicrobial textile or PP or mask or whatever that you see. And we already applying to FDA and EPA in different forms. But uh, the issue is that uh, how to protect uh, on different products Mm -hmm. These uh, idea is a little bit challenging that we are. So I can... it would be, and oh, I'm sorry, Vanessa. What? No, why, don't you, I... why don't you continue? Yeah, no, I was. That was um, a helpful elaboration. Yes, no, it was, and I mean, Mark did did hit it on the head of you know you're looking at a new composition of matter. That's the type of patent uh, statutory subject matter that we're we're allowed to to protect in a patent application. Um, and certainly, at, you know, we don't want to run the risk of a public disclosure happening as to the eureka moment of of your your invention. So, in broad strokes you'd be looking at a composition of matter that wouldn't necessarily have to be limited to what it's being used for. And what can be done um, is a layered claim set where we would capture the composition of matter, and then we can get into different compositions that that matter might be formed in if it's being if it's present in an emulsion if it's present in a solution um, we can capture uses of compositions of matter and so we can develop 
these sorts of things can be developed into a very large layered claim set that go from the broadest strokes of your eureka moment down to the very particular applications that you're seeking protection for. And we can build applications, the body of the application to protect not only the composition of matter, but specific examples of commercial products that you're hoping to take to market so that you have some protection there. So it would, you would protect these things via a layered approach where you would go from your broadest concepts down to the more practical applications of those concepts and working closely with appropriate uh, IP counsel and professionals, they would be able, once they start digging into the specifics of your technology, they would be in the best position to tell you what forms those claims should take to give you the best protection for your commercial embodiments. So this comes down to having a very nuanced drafting strategy and making sure that that drafting strategy, which is putting together the document that protects your invention, um, captures and supports what you're trying to do commercially. We just can't help ourselves. We just want to help. <laughs> so <laughs> we we would keep going all day. Um, yeah. And I, I and I think I, one of the key takeaways that you know both Mark and Vanessa shared is there's a a a, a level of abstraction in patents. So, you know, we talk about, um, uh, you know, a nail uh, for attaching a, a painting and you'd say, well, does it have to be a nail um, or could it be some, some adhesing means? Um, so we try to add a layer of abstraction because, you, you know, I, I, and understand the predicament, you can't possibly say, here's all the consumer types of products and, you know, I want to uh, claim against each one. So, you know, Vanessa nailed it in terms of sort of the broader categories that you would hit on, then, uh, you know, intruders would still fall within the scope of those claims. So level of abstraction is a very important tool for us uh, in, in the patent world, but I think that would be sort of a core to the strategy. And I think for everybody on the call, as much as we're trying to wring uh, as much of the decades of knowledge out of these three folks in a 90 minute period as we can, uh, it might be that you have to have some follow on conversations, right? We, you know, I think these are some great uh, approaches. And I think, Madi, what they're sort of saying is that there might be a way to capture in one patent the, the core. Uh, I think to Vanessa's point earlier, you probably might want to look at, you know, a, a layered strategy of, you know, is there specific equipment, right? How else are you going to protect this in, in multiple filings? Are there different parts of it? But you can probably capture a lot of it without having to um, patent all the individual little applications. I'm going to keep moving around the room if that's okay. And then we'll kind of come back to more questions you have, Madi, just so everyone has a chance to uh, be heard and be seen. I'm going to move to uh, Jean-Louis because I realized I skipped over some letters in the alphabet. I was trusting Zoom to do that for me, and it, it didn't. Uh, Mr. Yaconis. Hey, I, I'm Jean-Louis. Uh, I'm here uh, with a couple of hats on. So number one is uh, I have a consulting firm, Iconic Design, where we design products for other firms. And so oftentimes we're working with uh, inventors who are looking to us for advice on IP as well. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in startup companies my whole life, so I've got 20 something years experience and uh, over hundred patents that I've been through. So I, I know a little bit about it. And then oftentimes we guide them to, you know, firms like yourselves and others around town. Um, then in the other hat, um, we're also developing our own products under the uh, Morena Smart Home brand. So we're developing some nice. smart home devices, which is of course a very crowded landscape. And so interested to um, you know to hear best practices on on how best to protect our IP and strategies that we can use to differentiate our own you know products um, as we go out and initially seeding the market with some initial sales, but then looking to you know potentially partner up or get acquired by one of these larger tech firms and making sure that we've got everything lined up and you know protected in such a way that we actually have something that is sellable beyond just the products that we are selling to consumers. Yeah. Yeah. Great questions. Uh, freedom to operate is going to be um, <laughs> your, <laughs> your nightmare, I'm afraid, because you're right. Yeah. It is a crowded space. Um, and branding uh, also becomes a, a good friend of yours to, uh, to differentiate because, you know, a lot of the, um, <clears throat> a lot of the technology I imagine is sort of off the shelf. Um, you may have some special sauce, which, you know, that would definitely be worth looking at uh, either patenting or maintaining as a trade secret. But, you know, branding from what I've seen of 
uh, of the uh, smart home products that I've invested in, that I've investigated, that I've looked at. And um, yeah, there's some, you know, really creating a connection with the consumer quickly and substantively over, uh, you know, some of the misgivings, I think, that some of the um, uh, people might have with some of the larger technology companies and worried that a smart home, now I've just opened everything up to you, right? So how many, how many Google Homes do you have in your house that you trust Google to record, you know, and uh, Mark and I were on a, a, a Microsoft call the other day on a, on a Teams call. And halfway through, I was like, oh, we should have recorded this because this could be helpful for other people. So we hit the record button. And then it seemed to go back in time and record actually from the beginning of the call as opposed to when I hit record. So it was oh, almost wow. like it was, um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, tracking sort of the conversation somewhere. And then when I hit record, then it legitimized the actual, yeah, we did, you wanted to record it from the beginning. <laughs> I don't know if it actually did it, but you know, that's the kind of stuff people get worried about. So there could be a, you know, competitive advantage there and sort of branding in a privacy safe space would be, it would be an interesting approach, but anyway, just great, great, uh, uh type of company. Cause it's a super hard market for sure. Yeah, yeah. So maybe just one follow-up question then on the branding side of things, because of course, with uh, I know we've talked a lot about patents, um, yeah. but can you maybe speak a little bit about uh, trademarks? Because I know, you know, if you've got a custom brand, like we've got the Modena Smart Home brand, um, you know, you can start using it. My understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is you can start using that as your brand without any filing. Um, and then once you start selling, you can actually file to get it as a registered trademark. Is that correct? Or what's the timing associated That's bang with on. Yeah, okay. no, you've nailed it. You've nailed it. So, so for trademarks, you don't actually have to file a trademark registration. Um, you can proceed. You can put a TM symbol on it. In fact, um, you don't want to put a registered symbol on it before it's registered yeah. in the U.S. But uh, TM is a, is best practice and conveys to the market that you're thinking about it and you're treating it as a brand. Um, there are some pretty significant advantages to registration, so it's worthwhile at some point. Um, <clears throat> it's worthwhile at the point where you don't want to change your mark. Um, yeah. And just like a freedom to operate on the patent side, we on the trademark side, we recommend clearance to make sure that nobody else is using the same name because rebranding can be quite an expensive exercise. Uh, but once you you know it's a safe mark, nobody's taking a run at you, um, you've got some notoriety and some sales, so you know bigger companies can kind of see if they want to take a run at you and looks like that's not going to happen, that's a really good time to uh, file for a trademark registration. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. Happily, you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, continue on around the room. Uh, Larissa. Hello, guys. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And I just started uh, to navigate through the IP world because I was hired uh, a couple of months ago to work as an, I, as an IPS assistant here in Canada. Um, I'm from Brazil, actually. So no questions for me right now. Just glad to be here learning a lot with you guys. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, which brings us over to Matthew. I think you asked the question earlier. Now I'm going to ask you to you know, introduce yourself. Hey there. Yeah, my name is Matthew. Thanks for answering my question earlier. Um, I'm the director of sales and marketing at Santa Via. We make consumer water filtration products, um, and we're in the process of launching a number of new products in 2023 um, and so we're um, you know I've spent so much time and attention perfecting these products for our consumers and hopefully making some things that really excite people um, definitely new for us uh, as we haven't launched products uh, in a couple of years here um, and I wanted to you know this is our jumping off right uh, point for really figuring out what's the right way for us to protect IP on these products and um, you know, in some of these products, we're creating brand new uh, IP and some is just a process innovation, you know, different designs. So maybe, uh, you know, design patents and for some things, maybe, um, you know, some sort of use patents. So we're, we're looking at this, this whole landscape right now. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where, uh, where I'm coming from. But yeah, thank you so much for answering my, my previous question. And I probably have a lot more questions, so I might follow up actually later on. <laughs> Well, would be thrilled, Matthew, for that. And and I, you know, I can't can't possibly 
uh, you know, let it go that I'm not a huge fan of the, your company's products. So no. have the, um, uh, the remineralize, remineralizer at home to manage sort of the pH of our water. Nice. And yeah. well, uh, I, I, I just yeah. don't want to drink anything else. So <laughs> yeah, you know, we're making water snobs. That's our, our whole, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you will, so <laughs> count me in. If everybody on the call does a little tiny bit of research about water, uh, you'll quickly be get, wanting to give Matthew a call or go to, um, uh, well, Community Health in Calgary sells uh, sells your products. Yeah, we love Community Health. Yeah, they're a great retailer for us. Um, and I just want to point out, um, you know, Vanessa, you were talking about identifying core technology and kind of creating that layered approach. And so I think that's something that, you know, I totally had not even been thinking out prior to this conversation. So identifying what our core technologies are, I think is really important for us um, as um like especially for for some products that we launch, I think a design patent, um, just the, the look and feel of a product is all that we would need to protect. However, yeah. for more core technologies like our filters, for example, um, you know, figuring out how we can really create that layer defense around what is actually our core product, uh, a filter. So yeah, thanks. And, for and you're welcome. And I mean, other questions to consider around your core technologies is, what you're trying to do with them commercially. Are, are you looking for them to be acquired? Are you looking for them to be licensed? Are you looking to make sure you can keep other competitors out of your space? And so being able to answer those questions will also give direction to how you're going to protect those core technologies with patent applications. Because as I'm sure you can appreciate, there will be a slightly different tact in the drafting and that layered approach, depending on what you're ultimately trying to get out of those patents for protecting those core technologies. Great, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Matthew. and. <laughs> I don't want to share too much because, you know, uh, this, I've always, yeah, don't share too much. Business school, <laughs> you know, I, I always remember saying, um, you know, oh, if you have an idea, you have to talk about it. Right. Because, you know, uh, that's, that's the best way for people to poke holes in your idea. But then through this conversation, now I'm a little bit apprehensive about sharing too much. <laughs> so, yeah. well, and I think there's that, uh, that idea they shared earlier about, you know, what's an enabling uh, disclosure, right? So you can talk about what it does as long as it doesn't like let anyone do it. And so certainly that's something you got to practice. You got to get good at, you don't want the public disclosure, but you do want to be able to get some feedback from the marketplace on whether that's a benefit that they're looking to have, right? Um, whether they would pay X number of dollars to have pH balanced water. You, you're not saying what you know how you're doing it uh so uh, that, that's something you can practice and probably maybe a follow-up call with some smarter folks than i would uh would help you let you do that because you do want to test those ideas that's that's core i don't want you spending time and money patenting uh and, and and then realizing the market's not there definitely yes the, the goldilocks zone thanks mark for that uh that phrase there we'll definitely be using that again <laughs> yeah thanks Fantastic. so much uh, and then Scott, I think you're the uh, moving down that alphabet, the final one. There are a couple other uh, folks here in Nisha and Astrid. Based on the logo, you can probably guess that they work for Foresight and uh, might, don't have any ventures they're currently exploring that I'm aware of. Uh, but Scott, <laughs> if you do want to introduce yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, as Connie mentioned, uh, uh, we're in partnership together uh, to develop or developing a um, advanced carbon materials made from sustainable materials and away from fossil fuels. So this could be carbon black for tire manufacturers, uh, carbon nanotubes, carbon nanofibers. Currently all that's conventionally made by fossil fuels. We're developing it to use a uh, sustainable biomass. So just going down uh, this road of research, we've got uh, a couple year collaboration with UBCO uh, to help us out on the technology. So it's very interesting to hear your, your views of uh, patent protection and or IP protection. Oh, so Scott, we need to. that is a fantastic yeah. question. So you're working with academics and I'm assuming, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, UBCO has a wonderful IP policy that lets you keep all the IP, but you're yes. making sure that your academic friends aren't going to publish papers on this, right? Yes. So we have that protection. Um, yeah, that was discussed and 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 signed off and agreed with UBCO for sure. 
great insight, Stephen. <laughs> where, where, your palms get a little bit sweaty when you hear universities yeah. involved, and yeah. you know we we have incredible universities in Canada, but you know it does come with um, some strings attached sometimes, as, as Stephen you uh, yeah. alluded to. Yeah, and UBC UBC has a quite a voracious appetite <clears throat> for IP. Yep. <laughs> Probably one one technique. You know, I'm thinking that I can isolate how much those researchers know about the total process, um, so they can't put everything together. Yeah, it's a great trade secret yep. uh, protection step for sure. Okay. The the um, I mean, it waters it down when you know we talk about Coca Cola's trade secret because it's just you know such a cliche. But the reality is that that's that's part of at least uh, theoretically what they've done is. To keep the the whole away from any any one person, or you know one or two people maybe in yeah. the world have it, but uh, but to keep the parts disaggregated and it's it's it can be an effective strategy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, interesting journey we're going on, and uh, thanks for all your sage advice here. All right, I think we've got uh, four minutes left. Uh, are there any other kind of questions to the audience? Any quick ones? Otherwise, maybe there's a chance for our esteemed panelists to wrap things up for a couple of minutes, and then I will uh, talk about the next session we're running with our friends here at BLG. Or did you already do your lightning round of, of quick things to remember? <laughs> no, I, I, happy to add more if nobody has yeah. any questions. Um, you know, one of the, th we're, uh, uh, Stephen, preparing for this, and we're just sort of thinking about, you know, what's the, the good, the bad, and the ugly that we've seen, um, you know, working with companies. And uh, Vanessa, I know there's a couple of things that you put in the good category, which is probably a good good place to start and to leave the call. But <laughs> what are some of the things that you see companies doing really well around IP strategy? Um, well, you know what, this is um, it's at the, the risk of repeating ourselves more than more than once, it's really good in-house training, um, considering intellectual property right out of the gate, and making sure that that's that's married with what they're trying to accomplish um, from a business development and, and uh, commercial development standpoint. So, what that looks like is having that good in-house training, having meticulous note taking and record keeping in-house. Um, where it's very clear what the timeline of, of technology development is, who did it, when did they do it, who else was involved, what was done, um, having almost a living document that's something akin to, say, a thesis or, or a journal article where you have a, a nice complete story, um, complete with your, your experimental details that can be readily shared with your intellectual property professionals. Um, Having a reasonable budget and, and working within that reasonable budget, especially during your early years as a startup, making sure that you're leveraging your IP um, throughout your, your early years uh, in a reasonable way that's working towards your commercial embodiments or your, your commercial objectives so that when you get to the end of your, your leaner startup years, you already have some IP assets that can be leveraged for revenue, for keeping your competitors out of your space. You will already have um, some really great internal IP management policies and procedures and record keeping. And then that gives you a really strong platform for when your revenue streams increase and you can then expand your patent portfolio. So those are some of the things that I see them doing really well. Uh, training, marrying of, of development, um, reasonable budgeting, acquiring IP counsel, uh, and in those early years, so that when revenue streams open up, then they've got a good foundation to really expand. There you have it. All uh, right. The bad and the ugly for another time. Fair enough. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa, Mark, and Jason, for coming and sharing some of your experience today. Really appreciate it. I'm glad uh, everybody kind of had some specific questions that they're interested in answered, and they got a lot of value out of this. We do want to point out that we have another webinar coming up. It's going to be in January because the fall gets kind of busy for us, but we're going to be talking about ESG, so environment, social, and governance, and talking, and that is a space that is changing so rapidly. Uh, you got to check back quickly. I know that IP is evolving as well in the different rules, but uh, ESG is a very interesting topic, and certainly 
coming up and you know how to kind of leverage that both to talk to your customers to track it internally you know are there metrics and impact data that you should and could be collecting lots of wonderful things to think about there um, and sort of how does the governance uh, look at the environmental impacts that we're generating as clean tech companies a lot of relevance for all the foresight community hope to see you all there you can sign up with this wonderful little QR code or, and then, you know, if you're on the community of innovators, you will definitely be receiving an email about our upcoming events anyways. But I do want to say that is a good one to uh, check out there as well. Otherwise, that's the end of our 90 minutes. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too, and maybe learned a thing as well. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.